Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to this new CAP seminar. So today we have the pleasure uh, to have as our speaker, uh, Martin Kleinhans. Uh, so introduce Martin. Uh, he got his PhD in 2002 with the highest dis distinction on fluvial sediment transport processes. And since then he has uh, switched back and forth between uh, rivers, coasts and the sea and between earth and Mars. Uh, he has obtained uh, some career grants, including an ERC consolidator grant, and uh, all these uh, grants has, uh, have helped him to build up a program that includes effects of life forms on Earth, on the landscape patterns that are formed by rivers and coasts. He also has been able to simulate, uh, thanks to his lab experiments, one of the first uh, Mendelian rivers and the first estuary and the first Martian delta. And uh, he is also very active uh, in outreach uh, because he works uh, quite actively with primary education on science uh, literacy. And uh, he, he states, as he states, playing with water, sand and plants remains a, vi a very serious activity. So thank you, Martin, for joining us today. And uh, whenever you want to start, please go ahead. Thank you. Can, is my uh, voice okay uh, like this for yes. the recording? Perfect. Yes, thanks. Excellent. Okay, um, thank you very much for uh, joining to my presentation. I will be talking about uh, meandering rivers on Mars, and the significance of that is that meandering rivers on Earth are often associated with life, life forms interacting with the landscape, which is why they become meandering. So what we need to do is understand how meandering works on Earth as well as possible to investigate the possibilities that it gives indications about life forms elsewhere. So now this is planet Mars, of course, as it presently looks like, but it's also known already quite well that there has been a lot of fluid water on the planet, much of which is still there, frozen in the uh, subsoil. So that leads to the question, for example, how long has it been wet and uh, how much water has there been in the past and where is it all gone now? So one of the strongest indications we have <coughs> for past water is the morphology, the surface morphology of the planet. We're looking at a bird's eye view here on one of the most beautiful deltas there are on Mars. We can see clearly there's a shoreline here. I, th I hope you can see my mouse actually. The, the laser pointer. This is a shoreline here. This is a Gilbert Delta. And this Delta has formed because this volcano here melted the, uh, the permafrost so that the water flowed out into this crater. So it's also quite a local phenomenon. We can even do calculations about that with the laws of physics for flow and for the motion of sediment, uh, which are taken from Earth. But as you can see from the G in here, they're also properly made non-dimensional, so they can be used on other planets. This is the so-called Shields number, which uh, any decent geomorphologist knows by heart. So when this image came back from the uh, Curiosity lander, one of the first images it took, that every geomorphologist was calculating in the evening under the shower from the top of his head, the Shields mobility number, just to find out whether, what sort of flow conditions there have been to do this. And from that, we know it's about knee deep water flowing one, one and a half meters per second that transport is gravel. So we have those uh, abilities on Earth and on Mars to do something with it. So that allows us to calculate time scales of water activity. So uh, Francesco Salese, also here in the audience, has done this with me in uh, the recent past for the uh, delta in the Cesero crater where the Perseverance rover has just landed. And this delta here overlain by some colors for elevation uh, was then found out to have formed in a time span order of one century of water flow. Now you probably know better than I do that one century of wet conditions is probably not long enough to form life. So they, these calculations have implications for the uh, formation, uh, for the, the uh, emergence of life on planets. There's a more en enigmatic landform on Mars that has been puzzling us for, I think, about two decades that this image first came about. You can see these, these, these wrinkles here, right? It very much looked like a meandering river, 
there's bends that have been cut off. There's these, these banana-shaped bars in between. There's one difference though with meandering rivers on Earth. This channel is exposed and the rest has, been, has disappeared, possibly due to wind erosion. But is this really a meandering river? And the question is important because on life, these are on Earth, these are living landscapes. This place is teeming with life. Here you see a meandering river in Alaska with a single channel filled with sediment and it has sandy bars on the flanks, every other bend. And then the flat plain here with abandoned meander loops is completely filled with vegetation and sometimes also mud. And this is part and parcel of the meandering pattern here. You can already see in the image that it's quite a dynamic pattern too. All these ridges represent individual bank erosion events. And that shows us something else that's interesting. With each erosion event, for example, a flood or a season or whatever, there's also a renewed formation of floodplain on the inner bend. So this pattern is self-maintaining, despite the fact that it was so highly dynamic. And this kind of landform has emerged only fairly recently in the geological history of Earth. So about 400, 450 years, uh, 50 million years ago, we see meandering river deposits and outcrops appear. And before that, there are only braided rivers. There are very occasionally some things that look meandering, but most of them actually appear after the formation, the, the, the evolution of plants with significant rooting structures, with significant structure at all, with roots, of course, also come branches. So based on this, people have been saying that meandering is actually something closely related to the evolution of life, complex life, and that with strong rooting structures. Why the rooting structures? Um, one thing is that rooting helps plants to stick mud together, because what we also see in this period is that the alluvial mud rock recorded in outcrops that people can study is also increasing about this time. So when the vascular plants begin to develop root systems, there is already some mud around. And this shows a two-way interaction. There's a new kind of weathering on the planet. There's more intense biochemical weathering that produces mud in the hinterland on the one hand. So that's an effect from plants to sediments. There's also a vice versa an effect. Mud is a nice place for seeds to grow up and mud is being captured by the plants. So there's a, an interaction going on between the plants and the mud that's being captured. And also this is important for the meandering. So this is the point. Meandering rivers, do they need water? Do they need vegetation? And do they need mud? And I'm going to talk especially about the last two. <clears throat> there's an open question whether there can also be meandering rivers, for example, on Titan, but the resolution of our imagery at the moment is not sufficient to say that. And this is important because we're trying to figure out from present remnants, outcrops, cores, samples, whatever, whether there was mud, or what the character of the mud was, and what, whether there was vegetation or something, some other life form on Mars. So we're using the rovers right now to find primitive life forms that probably formed very early in the Martian history when there was significant flowing water on the surface. Okay. So I'm, I'll take one step back now, which comes from my teaching and uh, the work I did in, uh, in an institute working on the philosophy of science. <clears throat> what is it we're doing here? And with that, I'll also show what approaches I will be taking in this presentation. Whenever we do reasoning, we take causes and effects and mechanisms. And two of those three we have, and the third one is the one we infer. And we can do all three combinations. And by me drawing this up as a triangle, you can already see that we're doing three things. So when we're going to talk about mechanisms of meandering and find out whether vegetation is important for the mechanisms, we're having causes. We see the plants, we see meandering, and we have the effects. Pardon me. We see the causes, we have flow, river flow, and plants, and the effects, meandering. So we can do statistical correlation and then see whether we find mechanisms, generalizations that are valid for the science. This is induction. You can also do deduction. If we have causes and we know mechanisms, then we can predict what effects that will have. 
This is what happens, for example, in uh, the weather forecasting models. We take yesterday's weather, we take the Navier-Stokes equations, and we get the predicted effects, which is tomorrow's weather. And then we're going to do this. We have effects, outcrops, and we have mechanisms that we understand. For example, this and that causes meandering. And then we're going to infer in the past whether meandering had something to do with life. And this is called abduction. I'm putting up Watson there because in the Anglo-Saxon literature, there's a very uh, famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock Holmes at some point says to his uh, sidekick, Watson, this is pure deduction, my dear Watson. But he's wrong, actually, it's abduction. What detectives do is infer from the murder, the weapon, the traces, whatever, and general principles of human psychology and causality, who the murderer is, which took place in the past, actually, the murder. So this is detective work that we're also doing in geology. Right, so let's first look at the statistics. Here you see three rivers. The top one is braided. The bottom one is definitely meandering, single channel, bars and everything. And the middle one looks like a transition. It shows meander bends, but it also has multiple parallel channels in many places. This shows that these river patterns are actually part of a transition or a spectrum, if you like, rather than hard, clear cut classes of rivers. So whatever I'm going to say about, I say about rated and meandering later on, it's always part of a transition. These patterns are also dynamic. So here we see two aerial uh, images, satellite images with false color, with red for the vegetation of the Ganges, one of the largest rivers on earth. And this one is 1977. And the next image is 1999. And in that period of time, I'll flip it back and forth. You can see that the river migrated significantly with its channel. It also formed these transitional patterns. It looks a little bit braided, but the bands largely remain intact. So this is a dynamic self-reforming pattern, if you like. There's also something to say about the dimensions of these systems. From several theories about the formation of bars, but also from measurements for rivers and also tidal meanders in tidal systems close to the sea, we know that bent length meander length correlates very well with the width of the channel. So this tells us something about the proportions, right? If, if there is a meandering river, you would expect its meander length, wavelength, to correlate strongly with the width. And these relations are fairly strong, statistically speaking, within a factor of three. This is roughly right for a large range of scales. That's going to be important if we go into other planets and we suspect it's meandering, but it could also be another phenomenon. So now we are ready to define meandering. And we do that by the phenomena, by the dynamics, and also by comparison, it, uh, comparison with other patterns. So in the far right, you see an image, a classification sketch, if you like, and it divides up two groups, single thread rivers and anabranching rivers. An island branching I'm not going to talk about, but it basically means there's multiple rivers that are connected somewhere, and each and every river has its own pattern. So we'll ignore the island branching. The important bit here is the single thread rivers, because they show that pattern that island branches can also have. And there are two kinds there, laterally inactive rivers and laterally active rivers. So this is meandering. It is laterally active. That's important, right? And so is braiding. Whereas sinuous rivers can be static. They can just sit there and do nothing. And that could be, for example, an incised sinuous valley for some reason. That's not meandering them. All right, so meander is a sinuous single thread channel, despite occasional cutoffs, of course. It has pools and scroll bars in the bends, and that means there is sediment where this can be carved into. And meandering typically occurs in relatively small width to depth ratios. They're relatively narrow and deep compared to braided rivers. And with relatively narrow and deep, I mean it has roughly the dimensions of a pizza. We think of rivers as deep ditches, but actually they're really wide and shallow compared to other phenomena. Nevertheless, braided rivers are even more wide and more shallow. As soon as there is mid-channel bars, we're beginning to see braiding. Most importantly, meandering rivers are laterally active. That means they eat into the floodplain and there's a balance going on. 
of floodplain destruction and floodplain formation. That is a very important aspect of meandering rivers because it leads to the pattern preservation and all these banana-shaped bars piled together in the point bars. Right, now for some statistics. Can we predict when which pattern occurs? So first attempts already in the 1960s have been made with channel slope, it's the gradient of the valley, if you like, and bankful discharge, which is the flux, the total amount of water per second that comes by. And they thought at that time that it formed a very good relation, but in fact, this was a good relation for only a small set of rivers. And if you now compare that with this particular data set, this distinction between braided in the top and meandering in the bottom is not so good. So this suggests at best that these variables are important for the pattern, but it's not a strong relation. There's also another line of thinking in the geomorphological community, and it comes from, from linear stability theory, from, from theories that predict the formation of patterns, in this case, bars. And um, so that leads to a multi-bar pattern in the top of the right diagram or a single thread uh, pattern or meandering in the bottom part. This is mainly dependent on the width to depth ratio of these channels. As I explained earlier, that's also correlated well to meandering. But the distinction between the various rivers that we have in this data set is not so good, especially for the gravel rivers, this goes wrong. It's particularly relevant for Mars because there's lots of gravel on Mars. Since then, there's been a lot of development of these diagrams, and I'm showing one here by Jan-Rik van den Berg, who was my PhD advisor. And um, we repopulated it with novel data and with other fields. But what you basically see here is that there's a transition from meandering from single thread laterally inactive to wildly braiding with meandering in between. And these lines indicate above which you have the new emergence of a new pattern. And this diagram statistically showed that flow discharge and the related width and the valley gradient, not the channel gradient, but the valley gradient are quite well correlated to what goes on in the river patterns. <clears throat> so statistically speaking, <coughs> excuse me, if we had flow discharge and valley gradient and the sediment size, we could predict the pattern. Vice versa, if we have the pattern from a rock outcrop, we can try and infer what the conditions must have been. So we can infer paleo discharge or paleo gradient. It's all very nice, but that's statistics. What about the physics? The physics-based theories of bars basically start from the non-linearity of sediment transport. And with that, I mean that sediment is heavier than water, like sand, or also like the particles transported on the flows of Titan. And that leads to a threshold for the beginning of motion. Below a certain, certain flow velocity, nothing happens. Above that flow velocity, something happens. And a little bit more flow means a lot more motion of sediment. That's the non-linearity of that transport. That leads to carving of channels and throwing up of bars. But there is a negative feedback to this process that limits the growth of bars and the excavation of channels. And that limit is simply gravity. The deeper the channel, the higher the bar, the stronger the gravitational pull on the particles, so that limits the growth of these channels and bars. And this also selects the wavelength. And that all depends on the width to depth ratio of the channel again. And these theories also predict that bar length is generally a function of the channel width, which is good news because that's also our correlation from meandering. There's a th one thing I need to mention. Some people will have heard of meandering, for example, from high school geography. And much of that story is that it relates to the spiral flow we see in bends. As the flow goes through a river bend, the momentum of that flow makes the water pile up a bit on the outer bend. And that piling up leads to a transverse flow, which is called spiral flow, because it basically goes like a helicoidal motion through the river bend. Now, people have observed that in meandering rivers and inferred that that is actually the cause of meandering. But later we found in the 1980s that that's wrong. Meandering has as an effect a spiral flow, but the real cause is in the bars and the, or the bends and the interaction with the floodplain. So the spiral flow is an effect. This will become later important later in the story. But it points at an important process here, momentum of the flow. Right, 
So this is how it would work if we started from a straight channel. It would form, form alternate bars. And around these alternate bars, you would see the flow meandering a little bit, and that would lead to outer bank erosion here. So you can imagine that if these bars don't migrate too fast, you can see this pattern emerge. The fact is, though, that these bars do migrate. They do shift along the river too fast. So we need something to fix them. And that fixing is going to happen with vegetation, as you see here, or even with mud or, or clay or something like that. And that fixing does two things. It avoids that the bars migrate too fast so that the banks would be shaved off everywhere and the whole river would widen. Instead, the bars need to stay in place so that we get a widening meanderbend. And the second thing it prevents is that the flow cuts through the bend and basically creates a braided river. By the way, this is the river Allier in France. Uh, so it's between Moulin and uh, Vichy, and it's a beautiful river to do canoeing on. It's one of the last freely meandering rivers in Europe. But we have a problem. Let me go back to the previous picture. The idea in much of the older literature and in the geological data I've shown you is that vegetation in the outer bank here prevents the bank erosion that leads to relatively narrow and deep channels, right? So the vegetation here in the outer banks of the meandering needs to prevent the bank erosion. That was the key idea. That's why our routing was emphasized. This is a problem. In most of these rivers, the roots and all the cohesive layers don't extend all the way to the channel floor. Instead, near the floor of the channel, there is simply the non-cohesive sediment that was already sitting there from previous river activity, and that can easily be eroded. And if those banks can be undercut, the rest of the bank collapse is simply gravity, and it's not a problem to, to make that happen. In other words, there's actually no break on the bank erosion if there's vegetation on the outer banks unless those blocks sit there for some time. So this raises doubt about the older meandering models, including the models created by the meandering guru, Gary Parker. But it was also Gary Parker who came up with this same problem for the first time, he actually uh, discovered it. And he also then has this idea that maybe these slum blocks can here prevent the erosion a little bit. So here, Gary Parker is holding one of those slump blocks in his hand in a small river. But if we think about it, what does vegetation do in rivers? The roots, the below ground biomass, they can stick sediment together. They can reinforce it like the steel wires in armed concrete. And that could narrow the rivers. But the stems, the above ground biomass is also doing quite a lot. You can see here there's one, two, three, four generations of poplar and willow trees in the river Allier. And what happens here is that on this lower inner bend, the flow won't really go that fast. So it loses all its power to actually carve a channel and cut off the bank. So in that sense, vegetation on top of the inner bend bars can also avoid the tendency to do braiding. So rather than outer bank protection, inner bank protection is also important. This is surprisingly a rather new idea. But it works also in experiments. Here I'm showing an animation of experiments of 10 meters long and uh, 3 meters wide. And the two experiments are exactly the same, except that the top one has slightly cohesive mud. And the mud deposits on the lower areas, which is the inner bench. You can see that the bottom one turns into a braided river, and the top one turned into a beautiful meandering river, which has these scroll bar complexes, these banana shaped bars, and other kinds of features. And the original sediment is cohesionless sand, so this meander bend is simply eating away into cohesionless sand, and yet it meanders. So outer bank stability is not, not per se necessary for the uh, formation of meanders. And here in this animation, you can see that now this mud layer comes on top of the meandering uh, bathymetry. This is elevation. Uh, there's about two centimeters relief here. And this muddy stuff deposited here, and that is how it prevented the shoot cutoff. And the outer banks remain pure sand. This was enough to make meandering happen. And that can be done with cohesive sediment, but also with vegetation, as shown by uh, Paola's group and Christian Broderick and my own folks. This is one experiment by Christian Broderick. 
showing vegetation on the inner banks and there it prevented those shoot cut offs. So that has an important implication. It can be very thin vegetation, right? Unlike the vegetation that has very deep roots and first needs to evolve these big roots, meandering can already occur with very primitive vegetation with millimeter roots. It just needs to sit on the surface on the inner band. So far, I've talked about inferences from nature, from the big beast, from the complex planet that we're trying to study. And that's dangerous inference because it involves statistics. So this is that dangerous planet. I've also talked about experiments, which are miniature controlled bits of the planet, you could say, but they can be different in many significant ways from the real world. So they are complementary in our collection of knowledge and they provide much better control on the conditions, but they are also limited in what they can tell us. There's a third way that we scientists use, and probably many of you do too, is the numerical models. They have other disadvantages, they are virtual. So that means that they do whatever we tell them to do. Nevertheless, they allow us complete control also over which laws of physics and biology we put in. So I'll also show how the idea of inner bank stability also works with um, models. And this is a model description of a model, if you like. We model an open complex system with various interactions, but it also means that our model needs to start from an initial condition, the red in the top. Uh, in solar system formation models, this, this would be some sort of distribution of materials. In our river model, it's the valley. And we need boundary conditions because stuff is going in and out of the model. We have upstream influx of water and sediment, and on the other side, it goes out again. And then we used an engineering model, which has performed well in engineering practices where precise prediction is really of the essence. In this case, Delft 3D, which has been produced by the Delft Hydraulics Laboratory of nowadays Deltares. It calculates flow, then calculates sediment transport from that flow. It changes the morphology, and the change morphology in turn affects the flow. So this is a feedback. Now we added species to it, or really effects of species. Given a certain habitat, certain species sit there, like plants, right? They can settle, and other species don't. And they go through life stages of settling, growth, and mortality. And now comes the important bit, then they have engineering traits. Engineering traits which change the environment, in this case of the plants, but it can also be benthic animals like shells and crayfish and that sort of thing. And they change their own environment to make it more attractive for their own species. So when a certain clump of plants settles, it makes the environment more suitable for other plants to settle too. And it can be done by rooting or by above ground hydraulic resistance. So those are engineering traits actually, that it provides resistance to flow. And then we interact this with the morphodynamic model because it's the hydrodynamics in the substrate that tell us where the species sit. And on the other hand, it's the engineering traits that change the morphological behavior. So it can do flow resistance with the above ground biomass and it can do something in the soil. This is the result of a model that we built some years ago the flow is from left to right, the blue colors are water depth, and the green is the age of the vegetation, plus of course where it sits. You can see it's dynamic, and the meandering pattern is also dynamic. This is roughly the river Allier, so there are some cutoffs of bends, but nevertheless it reforms a meandering river all the time. And if you didn't have the vegetation, it would go grading. But note, there's no roots in this model. There's no cohesion in this model. There's no outer bank strength in this model. Like in our experiments where we had mud on the inner banks and nothing on the outer banks, here the effect is purely on the inner band. So that means it could also have been very primitive vegetation or a little bit of clay. Actually, I tested this for a whole series of scenarios, right? So on the top one, we see maps uh, through time, 300 years, zero on the left, 300 on the right with vegetation and mud. And on the bottom one is just pure sand, pure sediment, and there's no cohesion at all. And then we end up with a braided system. So, so far it works. <laughs>
To summarize so far, there are several theories on meandering. From the past and also in present literature, there are some confused views. If you have an incising river, it automatically becomes meandering for all kinds of reasons that take too long to explain now, but an incising river will focus itself in one channel. Also, if we have incipient breeding, the beginning of a breeding river, it also can look meandering. So people have been fooled in the past, also in experiments. So, Yay, I found meandering in my experiment, but actually it was just the beginning of breeding. And if you run the experiment a little bit longer, it will braid. Then there's this old view that bank protect protection happens by vegetation, especially by the rooting. So that leads to a low width net ratio, and that leads to alternate bars. We're looking at a cross section in the lower left here with the roots below and the plants above. And this should then protect the entire bank against erosion. And then recently, there's been much ado about nothing in the literature. I'll show that later. And actually, people are now saying, reinventing what we have known for 25 years or so, that mud can also do the outer bank protection as long as it goes deep enough. It also slows down or prevents bank erosion. So that's good. But we have seen there's a problem with the undercutting, right? The undercutting can still be unlimited in the sketch. So there's something else that needs to prevent it. And that's where the new view comes in. This is that the inner bar, bar can be protected by mud or vegetation or both. And that would prevent the cutoffs of the bends that would otherwise lead to braiding. And this is a process that can also happen in much more primitive situations with only a little bit of mud or very primitive sticky species. And this has been shown in a range of experiments and models. And it also works then for <clears throat> the very early vegetation stages in the Cambrian times and in very deep rivers where we don't have big sequoia trees or something like that. So what about meanders in ice? Are they really meanders? Well, they are dynamic. We're looking at a picture here of the Greenland ice cap in the western part. Actually, there's loads of meandering channels, which is really worrisome because it indicates that the ice cap is melting. But the fact is, these things are, me are dynamic. And they are dynamic because in the bends, here in the outer bend, for example, the momentum of the flow leads to more um, heat exchange with the bank, if you like, because the water is water, the ice here is also water. So it's mostly a thermodynamic problem of freezing and melting that these rivers maintain their dimensions. However, they are also incising. So that's also why they become really deep and narrow. So there's one bit of the principle of meandering the same here. It's about that momentum, but it's starkly different in that there's no floodplain, except if you see the ice as a cell phone floodplain. And there's also um, no, no sediment. There's not, not anything in the solid phase that's moving. Nevertheless, that flow momentum appears already to be sufficient to lead to dimensions that are similar to meandering rivers. The vertical axis here shows meander wave length, and the horizontal axis shows channel width. And this is here with dots from data by one of my bachelor's students collected for the Greenland ice cap. And this orange line here is the line that comes from that big statistical relation that I showed earlier for rivers. So this data is not significantly different from that other existing relation of rivers. It seems to be a factor of two lower, but the variation is a factor of three anyway. So in general, these meanders have about the right sizes. Now, what about these meandering ridges on Mars? And Francesco uh, is right now working on these things. People have argued that they are inverted meandering rivers. So here you see these beautiful bends. There's even a hint of scroll bars. So therefore, they are, these are meandering rivers with the floodplain eroded by wind erosion. That was the thought. However, we also see sinuous streams, sometimes dynamically meandering streams, under glaciers, under the ice, under the ice caps. And that means that they could also be esker meanders, if you like, sub-ice meanders. And in that case, we have a very special situation where the bottom is sediment that needs to be moved and eroded and can lead to congestion. You can actually see the thinning of the meander belts here. But also, the top is also limiting the flow. So it's basically an inverted river. And that is why I think we see these, these higher ridges on the outer bends, which is actually the deeper channels 
on the top into the eyes. So this is work to be continued, obviously. There are meandering tendencies, but I see all kinds of things that differ from meandering rivers, so I don't think they're really meandering rivers. What I've done, this is a fun philosophical excursion in the talk, is to deal with two different concepts of causality. And I bet that a lot of you are doing that too. And that gives us stronger science, so it's worth doing it. One is about production of effects. It's called mechanistic thinking, right? So we connect cause with the effect because causes produce those effects. Mechanisms like the mechanism of non-linearity of sediment transport calls in bars or the mechanism of hydraulic resistance by vegetation settling on the inner banks. The other one is called difference making in philosophical literature. But we can also see that as probabilistics or statistics or something like that. It means we see a dependency. We detect that there is a causal relation. For example, in my statistical diagrams of uh, some form of discharge and, and, and grain size and valley slope, we see a distinction between these river patterns. And that shows that these variables are actually important independent variables, one hopes. Right? So they need to make a significant difference. These two are really complementary. I can best show that with an example that is unfortunately rather close to our hearts at the moment. Cholera was discovered to be transmitted through water and by pumps that were polluted in the 1854 by John Snow. And he used these two different kinds of causation. He had the statistics. He had evidence for spreading by water and not by air because the disease outbreak was limited to particular regions, in uh, particular to one specific pump where people were pumping up that drinking water. He also had mechanistic causes. He saw that a lot of people having cholera were seeing kidney failure. And that told him something about urea in the human circulation. Now, that is now known to be a very imprecise mechanistic model of what happens with uh, human diseases. Nevertheless, it is a mechanism. He also knew, he also saw the mechanism that there was sewage, human waste, leaking into the water that was being pumped up by the pump. So that is also a mechanism and that led to the oral transmission of the disease. And you can see a parallel here with what's happening now. The COVID-19 disease is mainly uh, explained to us by two groups of scientists. The epidemiologists who are doing the statistics of mortality and comortality, comorbidity by other causes of death. Usually people who have already some kind of disease are much more vulnerable to dying by COVID as well. And that is virology, the people dealing with the virus and with the vaccines and trying to develop those. They're complementary also in meandering because we have these theories for bend and bar formation and for bank erosion, and they do predict that it works, but they don't predict the precise amplitudes of meanders or the rates of bank erosion, etc., etc. That's too complicated. For example, vegetation is subject to physical, uh, to biological laws, and we're only predicting physics. On the other hand, we have the statistical relations, meander dimensions, and channel pattern, and they quantify for us these relations. They're not mechanisms, but they hint at mechanisms. Correlation is not causation, we always say, but you can add to that, it's a damn good indication of causation. Right, so there has been some recent discussion about the question whether vegetation is needed for meandering or not. And they had in mind actually the notion that it could also be meandering on planet Mars. So these two folks concentrated on rivers, for example, in Death Valley where there's, as you can see, not much life in the soil, at least not plant life. But there's a problem here. They dealt only with statistics, not with the mechanistic causation. So they say, for example, rivers meander, form and migrate when helical flow circulation, blah, 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 blah. That's not true. Bar theory explains these things. The helical flow is a consequence, not a cause. And we've known that since 1982. And also here, there's the link with the geology on Earth, right? The rise of river meanders on Earth has been linked to riverbank stabilization by plant life. And here they say there's a fundamental test on the basis of data that they have irrefutable evidence that vegetation is not required for meander formation. Well, 
that's old news because mechanistically that has long ago been proven and even statistically as well. For example, those experiments that happened 10 years earlier, which I also played a part. So this is not conclusive reasoning. Is vegetation necessary for meandering? That question is a false dichotomy. We can have vegetation. Uh, vegetation can also help capture mud or produce mud, but we can also have meandering without the vegetation. There's various possible combinations that can lead to meandering. It's also open questions whether permafrost can do it. I conclude and summarize. Meandering may indicate life, but it doesn't have to. River meandering on Earth certainly occurred much more frequently due to the presence of mud and or vegetation, and the two are correlated. And there's two mechanisms at uh, play here. One is that the inner band can be protected against cutoff that leads to meandering, and the outer band protection is also important if it's thick and old enough. So then it can be related to life. But what about other sinuous forms that seem dynamic, that you could also go meandering? in ice or with cohesive stuff or under the ice cap. And it's mainly momentum and thermodynamics that is doing the job. And we know not nearly enough about that, but it seems clear there's no life forms involved there. So final question, are meanders on Mars indicative of life or doesn't it have to be the case? After all, Mars is a muddy and icy planet. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, thank you very much, Martin, for this very interesting talk. Okay, so we are going to open now the session for questions. So if you have any questions, please uh, raise your, your hand. Or if you don't have any microphone, you can also uh, type them, you can write them in the chat and then I'll read them loud. Okay, so before, so maybe I can start with questions uh, so that I let people uh, some time to write their questions in the chat in case they need. So it seems um, that by uh, analyzing these meandering features or morphologies on the surface of Mars, it doesn't seem conclusive, no, for the search of, of life. No. Is that your... No, yeah, if, if, if you just look at the fact that it meanders and it has some features, then it's certainly not conclusive. And also, we can even raise questions as to whether they really were meandering rivers. They might also be sub-ice meanders and that requires a closer look at the specific features that are being preserved. So we really need to understand the mechanisms and dynamics of terrestrial meandering to be able to do that. But yes, meandering is definitely not a certain indication of life. Okay. And then I was also wondering, because you showed, you know, this uh, formation of these meanders that are very like, flat at the top, and then you said that they are formed under a soup ice, no, meander? Ah, yeah. is that, is that, so uh, is that the case for all the meandering forms uh, that are found on Mars? So all of them show the same kind of morphology, or are there some uh, differences? depending on the place or the region on the surface of Mars? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. Because this, this flat top, the, the question is whether it really is flat and whether it could have become flat by the later erosion, right? Because the surface can also have been flattened by wind erosion. But it actually isn't flat. It shows the deepest channels in the outer bends, where they shouldn't mm. be, well, they should be deep down, but they're actually deep up. So I think that's where they carved into the uh, the ice. But you are right, there are also other uh, systems on Mars. Let me go to this picture, for example. This is the, the Eberswalde crater. And uh, here is something that has been interpreted as a delta in the past. And it also has this beautiful, it seems to be a meandering bend. And in this case, there's also doubt. And it has been uh, written up by uh, Mangold in 2012, actually. Because you do see this bend and it has these scroll bars building out, etc. But it's been cut off here, etc. The problem is twofold. One, here, this is lower than that. Now, why would a meandering deposit in the outer bend be com completely filled with sand? And in the inner bend, with the sandy bars formed, the sand is left, is disappeared. That's funny. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure that this is meandering, actually. 
There's another problem, of course, this crater is not leaky. If you would flow the water into it, you don't have enough time to form this, this big delta and this meandering delta before the whole thing starts to flood, actually. That's what these uh, funny graphs on the right indicate, but I'll spare you the details of that calculation. So there's, there's problems. There's various kinds of meandering on Mars, but you can ask questions about all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the audience? I see none in the chat yet. Uh, let me see this one. Very nice talk, Martin, from Francesco. Um, no, no other questions. So, uh, okay, so I have another question just in case. <laughs> so, in, uh, I was wondering whether in any of the icy moons, these uh, meanders have been found. Yeah, um, there is some, uh, there are channels on, uh, on Titan. And also the fluids and the solids there, I don't know off the top which stuff is actually there, but those are suitable to form channels and to transport sediment and all that. And I think also the lander indicates that we have these rocks that can do it. But the resolution of the imagery is unfortunately just not enough mm -hmm. <laughs> to see those meanders. So when they came in, I've of course been looking at them and the, the, no matter how close I get to my computer screen, you don't see really meanders. But there's something uh, else, let me think if I can show that in the, um, in the ice meanders. These ice meanders, they show something that we might see on Titan. They sometimes have very straight bits and then there's a sharp bend again. And some are really sharp. So for example, here is almost a right corner, right? And also here, there's almost a right corner. These extremely sharp meander bends, they happen in more cohesive stuff so we see that on the mud flats in estuaries, we see that somewhere in the Ganges River near Kolkata, and also we see that very frequently in ice meanders. So I wouldn't be surprised if in some future mission we find that to happen on the icy planets. Mm, very good, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, again, Zormo, here's a question. Uh, can the inverse topography of the meanders and bars be a consequence of permeabili permeability of the deposits and later cementation? Coarser sediment in the riverbed would be more permeable and allow cementation, and mud in the bars would not allow cementation and would get eroded easier. Yeah, this is, a, this is an excellent question. So the, the, the question is what becomes stronger, right? And the fact that the, these inverted systems on Mars, they are inverted, suggests that somehow the floodplain was eroded more easily. But um, this, this involves two processes. There's the lithification of the floodplain sediment, which is clay stuff, which can become, I don't know, slate, rock, right? But there's also the channel sediment. And if you want to do cementation there, something needs to percolate it, some, something needs to enter it. And on Earth, there are plenty and plenty of salt minerals that can do that. How this works precisely on Mars, I don't know. Right? I think this is actually one of the more open questions. The nature of the planet as it has formed and the types of rocks and minerals we have there and the cementation processes, we don't know enough about that yet. So this is certainly a possible mechanism, but the only way to try and find out what happened there is if we actually had a way of sampling that material in the meander bands, the exposed meander bands, or maybe actually we can do that. I'm just now wondering with the, the spectral images. Maybe we can do mineral identification on these ridges. I need to talk with Francesco about that. I don't know. Very good. Yeah. Okay, there are. there's another question in the chat. So uh, from Ma Maria Angelica Leal, thanks for your lecture, Martin. In the case of Titan, is, is it possible to have meanders of methane? Yeah, I think it is. Mm -hmm. So that means that we need to have either incision that would already lead to some sort of fake meandering, but you could also think of mechanisms that lead to cohesion on the inner banks. So if there is already freezing there, right? So one of the things I've really want to try out in the lab in one of the sandboxes 
is install a freezer below the sand and start freezing it and then flow warmer water over it and see whether with and without the freezer, you actually get more meandering or braiding tendencies. But I think that the same thing would then apply, apply to the methane fluid and the other solids on, uh, on, on uh, Titan, because there's a density difference between the solids and the fluid, and that's enough to kick off uh, this, this nonlinear process of bar formation. So in that sense, I think it might work. What we need is the cohesion in the inner bands. Very good. Thanks. And there's another question in the chat. If these morphological features were driven by water flow Mars, where, where the water end up, where did it go? Yeah. So the hydrologists uh, uh, tell us that there is water frozen in Mars soil. And there have been estimates of a, a frozen uh, permafrost layer of about one and a half kilometers deep. And also there have been estimates of how much water there ever was on Mars. And it's a one kilometer thick equivalent layer for the whole planet, as opposed to our several kilometers thick layer on Earth. So half of that water approximately has disappeared in outer space because Mars is a relatively small planet with low gravity, and the other half sits on the planet. This is what I get from literature. But the interesting question is also, if we have these features on Mars, like these features, we need to trace them to see whether there is any hint of the deposit of sediment at the termination of these channels. So you can also ask these questions in the sense as where did the channels go and where did they end and how do they end? Do they form a delta or does it simply disappear? Right? In, in ice cap meanders, meanders can suddenly appear and suddenly disappear because there's freezing and vertical motion. In rivers, you wouldn't expect vertical motion. So there's various ways of tracing where the water went. Okay, thank you very much. Um, are there any other more questions? Yeah, they all thank you for the for the very nice talk. And <laughs> okay, if there are no other questions, then uh, thank you very much, Martin, for joining us today. And uh, let's hope that the situation improves and maybe we can have you here one day in the future. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.